thank, thank you all for, for showing up and uh, hopefully some, some of our viewers. And maybe you can just say, um, if at any point any of you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to shout them out and uh, do my best to, to answer. But um, uh, first of all, thank you to Lori Zimmer and uh, Mark Nerd for showing up and yeah, hopefully providing some sort of order and structure to this whole thing. Um, you know, so with this show, um, you know, the title is called Love Never Saved Anything. Uh, it's kind of based on, on my year last year, and it was a relatively rough one personally. Um, yeah, it's one of the years where everything that could go wrong sort of does go wrong. Um, and having a conversation with a friend of mine, you know, that I was, I was talking, I was kind of worried about losing a few things. And uh, they said, well, you know, at least you're doing what you love. So yeah, but you know, love never saved anything. And it's kind of based on this idea that, um, you know, hard work and focus and dedication kind of gets you to where you need to go instead of this kind of idealistic uh, dreaming mentality of just sort of waiting and seeing how things go. And so, in a subsequent conversation with a friend of mine, Mia Ando, um, you know, again, I was just kind of you know, bitching and muttering about stuff, and she said, uh, just put it into the work, you know, whatever you're going through, just kind of put it into the work, so you can, when you need an outlet, when you need a place to go, when you need something to talk about, just go into the studio and put it into the work, and so that was exactly what I did. Um, those of you that, that may have followed some of the work that, that, I, that I do, um, I was generally known for kind of the architectural stuff, and you know, looking back, I realized that, that a lot of the architecture stuff that I was doing was more of this kind of contemplative stillness, um, kind of like an outsider looking in. And so, with, with this new work, I tried to I tried to revise my approach. And instead of being someone that was on the outside looking in, um, dealing with from the inside approach. And so, uh, you know, for me, the only way to kind of go about doing that was to to kind of get into the middle of it and, and you know deal with actual like people and situations and relationships and whatever else. And so. You know, I used, uh, yeah, I started using friends and models and everything else to kind of illustrate some of the things that I was going through. And then, for me, I've always been, been so, somewhat annoyed when, when people use kind of artist therapy, like, you know, my dog died, so here's a piece about my dog dying, because, you yeah, know, you don't give a shit about my dog. Um, but I, I do think that every person kind of goes through these sort of universal things of, you know, like, Life, death, happiness, salvation, love, riches, fame, fortune, whatever it is. Everybody wants the same things in life. And so for me, like with, with this work, I try to kind of to build a middle ground where everybody has the same ambitions, desires, or, or whatever else. Um, you know, and for me, like I use the, the nautical and sea imagery um, kind of as a jumping off point. Um, I use it for a number of reasons. You know, first of all, like the sea's always kind of played a significant role in my life. I always lived near the sea. Um, my son's been a sailor, I'm a Pisces, my dad was in the Navy. Just, I've noticed like, throughout my life there's always been this kind of nautical um, reference that, that seems to be there. And then, you know, secondly, like, when you go through and you read a lot of the, the nautical superstitions or traditions or whatever else, it's just the visual lexicon is so rich that it's impossible not to kind of come up with these ideas and, and to see these paintings or, like, you know, whatever it may be. And so I use that as a jumping off point to kind of make the, the work. Um, so, so that's kind of where, where the work itself came from. The, the show itself, in terms of like the, the physical place that you're sitting in and the way the show came to be, um, has a lot to do with some, some of the stuff that was going on last year. And that was, you know, here I'm in the studio and I'm making work and I feel like I'm not getting to where I want to go. And I realized that, that, that the formula was all wrong. And so one of the things that I did, I, I guess now it's about a year and a half ago, is um, I reached out to Pat McNamara and, and Roger Klein, who run the PMM Arts Management. Hang on a second. I'm going to interject because I'm not just standing up there for that reason. Sorry. So, let me ask you some, some, some questions about that, Mr. Hicks. So, first of all, can you go back for a second and talk about your process? Because I don't know if um, everyone here realizes the intense yeah. sense of like going through a studio and seeing how many stencils and how exact it is kind of blew my mind. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I use stencils to create all the work that I do. Um, it's a very process-heavy um, technique, you know, and I think most people are kind of familiar with more sort of Banksy-style stencils, uh, the, the one color, um, kind of, you know, witty comment, you know, the quick hit on the street and then sort of go on your way. You know, for me, I think from, like a, from a screen printing background, 
I started uh, you know, doing t-shirts and everything else, somewhere along the way to kind of segue into doing fine art. And, uh, you know, with me, I've always kind of had this sort of masochistic side where, like, I, I kind of need to beat myself up and make sure that there's, like, manual process. This is exactly what I was thinking when I, when I see how many specimens go into it. Like, for example, like, that piece, how many... I, every piece in here has between between 10 to 15 centimeters. And if you mess so, up one layer, you have to start. And, and it's 12 to 15 layers, but then there's different areas. So even though there's 15 layers, you're actually spreading out 25 different different separate areas. And so, um, but you know, the, part of the idea for that, though, was that for me, I, I would like to think that if you don't like the images, if you don't like the ideas, you can't deny the, the, the work technique. You, know, you can't deny like, the process that goes along with it. Really. And it makes sense to me because um, I used to look at the, in the vintage sculpture of grass and honey, some of these. It kind of makes sense to me that you're also a photographer because, like, photo people are very different than art people, and they're like totally nervous about the process. They're like, oh yeah, I'm just about to stop, blah, blah, blah. And then, it's and, also a control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, totally, it's, it's kind of the same line of thinking, the process of sentence. Uh, yeah, that's. I appreciate everyone's artwork, but for, for me, like, I, I need to have complete control over stuff. Like, the, the poses, the models, the look, everything that kind of goes along. Like, I, I needed to know that I sort of had some sort of hand in that. So, like, you know, whereas I, I, I love the work of, of plenty of artists out there that use borrowed imagery, um, for me, I, I see it as like I was responsible for that. I can't, like, I can't leave it open to interpretation. I can't leave it open to, like, the randomness of someone capturing, like, the feeling that I'm really going for. And so being able to see it through from, like, you know, this half cocked idea in my head to photograph, to stencil, to spring out, to art. So it's really a lot more than just like, hmm, we're done with the picture today. Yeah. And then, you know, take the photograph. And then years ago, I used to, I used to do a lot of stuff. Like, I used to. You used to hand cut your stencil. I used to, for seven years, I hand cut everything and built carbide and then. Right. The, um, <laughs> the, the one of the last pieces that I did was actually, was actually a water piece that uh, you can find online. But, I spent three and a half weeks um, working 10 to 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and I started sitting down and trying to do the numbers of how long it actually took me to cut it, and I realized like, there was no physical way for me to like charge enough to justify the means and the medical expenses that would later ensue right. with like, <laughs> the carpet tunnel and everything else. And so, you know, and at a certain point, like, you, have to, you have to figure out where your loyalty is. Is your loyalty to, to your art and to the mission that you have? Or is your loyalty to the production? And it's sort of the same way of like, well, like, this is a great car, it was made in the US, like, but it doesn't run. Yeah, but it was made in the US. You know, it's that same idea, like, yeah, it was all hand cut, but it looks like shit, but it was all hand cut. And so I, I tried to, yeah, I'm a complete and total gift, but look at what I made. And so, you know, I tried to kind of get to the point where, where I consolidated the two, found, found the best possible way of conveying like, the, the image that I had in my head onto the canvas. And so, you know, this show, I think, so far has been the most successful for a for team. Do you about gallery now? So, um, Well, I'll, I'll leave out by saying I have background. I work in galleries. And I've noticed in the last few years, um, I'm having, I'm friends with a lot of artists, and more and more artists are coming to me asking me for help with things that a gallery should be helping them with. Like, their press release or pricing or things like, like well, what is your gallery? How are they earning their fifty percent? And I just I see it more and more every day. And so I thought it was really interesting. Part of why I wanted to be involved in this talk is you decided to leave galleries completely, um, the traditional model, and kind of well, not so, not so much a decision as just kind of being routed out. But yeah, I mean, but it's a bold move because it's like really untraditional, and I think it's kind of a little bit scary for. For some artists that are afraid to not be associated with like a roster of name. Yeah, I mean yeah, I mean it is sort of, you know, it is a little bit unnerving leaving something that, that you know, has centuries of uh, you know history of, of having kind of patrons or people that sort of validate you externally and say, that, okay, this guy's the only one he, he's the one that you should buy work from and, and going straight on the work itself. But it's also really progressive too in that like for me, like I sell work to people that I've never met, that I will never meet, and they've never seen the work. It's just all online. So it's really you don't need that gallery anymore. Because you're real and, and so many more collectors these days are also going directly to the artist because they can reach them on Facebook or tweet at them 
and they don't need to put in their good graces with the gallery owners anymore. Yeah. So how does it work? How does your new model? Um, well, so so with the TMM for, for those of you who don't know, I'm represented by Pat Magnarella Man. Um, and Pat, I was actually the first artist that Pat contacted in 2007. You know, he said, uh, when he first contacted me, he called up, and, you know, actually it was Roger Klein. Roger Klein was, was part of GMM. And he said, you know, look, you know, we're, we manage musicians. We see some similarities in terms of, like, artists and, and musicians. Uh, you know, there's this creative, like, product that you have that sort of has a shelf life that we sell to people, and then and then turn you generate new stuff. And so, so there's this, this cyclical nature, so there's always something new to come And they're, and they're successful in that. They, yeah. they manage and so, yeah, I asked him, I said, well, you know, okay, it's great you manage musicians, anyone that I've heard of. And so he goes, yeah, well, we've managed, you know, Green Day for 15 years. Um, we used to manage Weezer, the Boo Boo Dolls, and if you look at, like, the, the roster, people that you manage for a year. Great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Roger was the one who was, was responsible for signing social distortion back in the day. And so, <laughs> you know, if you really think that he's not fucking around, that they actually kind of know what they're talking about. And um, I've always, always liked and enjoyed the way they handled themselves. They were always respectful. They always kind of answered the questions straightforward. And it just it was never the right right time for me to kind of work with them. And so, you know, a couple of years had gone by, and then yeah, I just had this series of incidents kind of happen with galleries where, you know, you, you approach this gallery, you know, all right, I got this idea. I want, here's what I want for the show. Here's all I want it to happen. You know, make this work, and you're supposed to put it on the walls, and you sell it, and you know, like I said, there's a little bit of compromise along the way, but, but ultimately, you hope, you hope to align yourself with someone that wants to see your vision through to completion into like the home of the collector or the museum or whatever it is. And just, these things happen where like, I would do a show, I would show up to the show, and they would only hung half of it. They decided they were going to put the rest in the warehouse and save for later. Like, you know what? That's not what my idea was. Um, you know, none of the stuff like them kind of shipping work to different places and selling for different prices, you said, and then a collector contact and going, why the fuck did I pay twice as much for this than this guy did? And, you know, I, I couldn't answer any of those questions. I really didn't have any answers for them. You shouldn't have to, that's not your job. Yeah. You have to make work. Yeah, I, I'm supposed to do, I have one job, just make work. And on a good day, I do that well, on a bad day, I do that mediocre, but that's my job and I do it. And so you, you want to find a gallery that sort of supports whatever it is your idea is. And, so, and they're out there, but... And I just got tired of it. And so I called up Pat, and after talking to him for a number of years, and go, all right, it's time to pull the trigger. Um, how do we make this happen? And so, you know, I told him that I needed, needed to start working with them. Um, you know, I dropped the gallery that I was working with here in New York. Um, never looked back. Never been happier. Uh, the best decision I've ever made. And now I have like a team behind me that, you know, I go like, okay, I want to do whatever, it's murals, or I want to do like backdrops for theaters or whatever else, and they go, okay, we'll find a way to make that happen. And, you know, sometimes it's successful, sometimes it isn't, but the fact is, like, they're there to support your vision, not to redirect you, you know, and I know it's... You think because galleries all have their own kind of vision, too? Galleries have one, one mission and one vision, to sell your work and make money. That, that's it. They don't, they don't give a shit about your career, they don't give a shit about who you are. Don't really agree with that. That's a they, very They care about your statement. career only in the fact that like they that your career will make them more money. I think that I think that is one of the things. And I think that's too much of a blanket thing to say about your gallery. Well, we're not here to trash. Maybe you're here to trash galleries, but I'm not here. No, no, I'm not. But I mean, like, <laughs> the, the pivot point for any gallery is money. And when you stop making that I money, I mean, it's true, but, like, why is, if that were absolutely the only fact, then gallery owners would like, why wouldn't they just sell cars? Yeah, but, you know, well, that, because they have, there's a passion there, and then, you so know. So, let me backtrack a little bit. It used to be, it was at a point where, like, you had more than time. So, like, if you did a show, and maybe the show wasn't as successful, they understood that you as a person, as an entity, kind of had a greater vision that was going to lead to bigger and better things. And I, I think, I think in this kind of ADD sort of mentality, it's like, if your show doesn't do well, sorry, there's 15 other people that are doing something. So we don't need to get behind you. We're going to move to this guy now. And so I, I think that, like, in the same way with the record industry, I'm not denying be, that, but I don't think that's true, like, 100% of the time. Well, nothing's 100%. Right? <laughs> but I'm, I mean, I'm just talking like, from my experience. So I right. think that, okay. yeah. That's fair enough. Uh, I'm, fair, I'm fairly bitter and fairly jaded about all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? And in, all, in all respect, I was like, before I started really talking. Um, <laughs> 
the beginning, you, you, just, you just find whatever entity suits you best. And for me, like dealing with someone that's just kind of on a one-on-one -on -one thing, where I can get up an email, where I can make a call, and I can have someone actually pick up the phone, where I can have someone go like, "Yeah, no, we can't do that." Instead of like, you know, being this kind of yes man. Like for, for me, that, that's what I need. I need someone to. I think you're being a little too dreamy about this. You know, and, and being realistic about what, what I can accomplish and what I can't. And so, um, for me, the, the current situation that I have is, is the best suited for my personality. And, and I mean, some people work amazing under, under the, the gallery model, and, and I'm jealous of them, quite honestly. I mean, I would love to be that guy that really makes sort of like, you know, best hits and you can sell work, and, but I'm just not that guy. Um, you know, that the work that I do is, is fairly complicated, but actually, you do need to get about the technique and the process and the ideas and, and stuff like that. And, you know, so, so I think like, for the situation I have is the best that I can ask for, and uh, I'm pretty happy with it so far. But how does it work? So, you know, the gallery is 50-50, you know, mm -hmm. that's how it works. How does it work with um, working with managers? Do you, like, is there like flat rates and percentage of sales? And well, we go into, we go into things with the project, project, you know, mentality. Like, mm -hmm. we have to show, here's how much it costs. You is there like a retainer that like all year? Like, no. Okay. I mean, it, it, you know, I'm always leery of people that have like flat rate, flat rate things because they get, you know, if you have a flat rate thing, if I say like if I pay you X amount of dollars per month, then it doesn't matter how you do. You're still going to get paid. So yeah. I think like it, 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 yeah, yeah, any incentive that you have for it, the performance based incentive is, is, is going to be the best because if I fail, then you're going to fail. And I know that you're tied to me, like regardless of whether or not you want to or not. You're tied to like my success with others. You have the same interests, and so you're going to give me honest feedback. And so with this, like we approach approaching from a project basis. We want to do this. We kind of do this project and make sure that it has you know some money there, and then afterwards we split the profit. The, the profit. And um, you know, and I'm sure the HR kind of has their own sort of sort of deal with you. So when you work with them, it's just like project based. There are times when you don't work together, and you're like yeah. time. I mean, you know, if I meet a collector on the street and, and you know, it's not during a show or whatever else, and he comes to my, my studio and buys something, then that's my sale. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, if my manager sends something to me and, and it's his guy, then yeah, clearly you, you know, you've earned that, that money and I have no problem giving it to you. Right. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of how, the, how, how it works and so forth. It's been great. And you know, they so manage a couple other artists. Yeah, but, uh, like Charlie Baker, Dan Baldwin, Miss Bugs, they work with T Face and me. So I mean really there's five people that are, yeah. you know that are part of it. It's not like a, a roster with thirty artists and it's like we're figuring out you know where you fit in. I mean it's enough that you can kind of right. get followers and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Do you think that this is like going to become the next model, because I, I mean, I feel like everything's changing, people are doing pop-ups, people are closing their, like, brick and mortar galleries, they're doing art fairs, and whatnot. Could the next <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that it's, that it's going to be the new way, I think it's going to be another model. Another way. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's some people that operate great in the gallery system. Yeah. And, you know, like, if I was, if I operate great in the gallery system, I'd be part of it. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I do. There's a certain level of collector that like they, they want that gallery nomination, they want that stamp of approval, that gallery saying like this artist is the shit. Well, because it's a social, it's a social aspect to yeah. it as so. well. And, and then yeah, people want to be able to, to, to brag and say like, well, yeah, I mean, there's some galleries you go in and like unless you know the gallery owner, you're not going to buy a piece of work. You're going to be put on a ton of, ton of lists, and like you know the premium collectors are always going to get the first stop. And so yeah, yeah there, there is that kind of bragging rights. It's the reason people buy like you know a, a Lamborghini instead of a you know, whatever Monday or whatever, but um, and, and those people always gravitate towards that. People that, that have art guiding the decision of what it is that they do will at least be open to the model that we have. And I think that like that that's where things kind of open up. I mean, to, to backtrack, I mean, I kind of came from like this sort of punk rock background. I grew up south of DC, and so I grew up in the era where like Discord Records and Minor Threat um, kind of ruled my sort of area. And even back then, I mean. What they were doing with music is sort of what we're doing 20 years later, which is they were putting on their own shows, they were pressing their own records, they were doing their own distribution, flyering, and everything else. And so they bypassed the whole major um, record industry and, and made a living in an industry out of the DIY music stuff. And you know, the, Laurie and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. But it's like art kind of took over because of the internet. Like, I think I think a lot of that, a lot of that that time where like you would. 
you spend time making mixtapes for your friends and you sit there and you listen to it like, late for the night and you think, oh, this is, oh, this is great, you try to go to the record store and find that album. That's not going to replace with a bunch of clips on the internet. And so I think it becomes such a visual ADD culture that it, the visuals have overtaken the audio. And so now the like, art is a new punk rock. And so sort of in, in, in line with that, like, now we're doing our own shows and we're doing our own distribution and we're doing our own sales. You know, and, and, you know, we're not doing anything better. We just have a much better model to kind of kind of mirror. You know, it's been done in the audio world. We're just trying to do it in the visual world, and uh, it, I don't see any reason why it can't be successful. I mean, our art should be the primary guiding force between like, making art and buying art and everything else. It shouldn't be like the bragging rights. Um, and I understand that's a component of it, but you know, what we make should be the primary force. I have a question actually about. Going back to just thinking about what you're saying, like making art without having working with the gallery. Usually, like gallery owners used to be like mentors, and they would. Who, who do you look to now to help shape your career? Like, like I know some gallery owners would say, "Okay, well, you're paintings of cherry sausage." You know what I mean? But they're also supposed to serve as like help guide you in making new work. Do you have to like think to yourself for that, or just your friends or people? Oh, I mean, like. Yeah. It's Shepard Ferris, he's been like the single biggest driving force. I mean, I know that a lot of people kind of throw his name out because he's the biggest, but I mean, you know, like, back when I was in Baltimore, I had a 6,000 square foot warehouse. I started throwing art events um, in like 94, something like that. So, I mean, 20 years ago. I mean, to, to put it in perspective, it was like two years after he'd learned to just start using the computer. And I was flipping through juxtaposed, saw an ad for some posters, asked this guy if he wanted to show some posters. We sold some and he came out. It happened to be Shepard Ferry. And you know, at that point, I'd actually gotten out of art school, and I just I didn't like what art world was. I didn't like what it was about. So I, I just screen printed T-shirts. I mean, I was just doing regular generic T-shirts for companies or whatever else. And then after seeing Shepard, he was the he was the guy that was uh, kind of doing things on his own way. And so I remember moving out to San Diego, and like, Shepard, I'm moving out. You know, can, can you help me out? And uh, you know, ever since then, like anytime I have like a question, like I remember getting one big job, and like, I have no idea how to fucking do this thing. You know, he was the one that gave me advice. He was like, you, know, you can you can price it to what you think your work according to the book. You can price it according to what you can stand behind and fight for. Basically, no, you know. And so, being able to talk him up and ask him, like, what's this guy like? What's this gallery like? You know, how do I price this? And, and then there's a few other artists along the way too that are just like that. And people that that are so now you look to like your yeah. and, so. and, and now too, you know, like, like even like Pat, you know, like yeah. talk on him up a bit. What do we do next? You know, it's like it, I think in, in a weird way to become a success more, you need to sort of become handicapped for a lot of other stuff. You need to just sort of lose yourself in your studio and kind of forget about everything else and just fucking make art. Mm -hmm. And if you're worrying about like how does it get shipped here, how are we gonna sell it, how are we gonna transport it, like what about this and that, like you start kind of losing track That's of That's a lot, and it's always the time. Yeah. And so I, mean, I think I think the most successful artists want to do one thing when they want to look at it. I'm just wondering if he then chose this gallery and set up the whole show. And, like, how was that? Yeah, this gallery actually they had rented out previously for a Charming Baker show, I think, three years ago. Um, so it was familiar to them beforehand. But yeah, we knew they wanted to do something that was in Manhattan, that was fairly central, it was easy to get to. Um, you know, and certainly the, the street level access was great. And so, yeah, I mean, it was something that they scouted out previously. But, you know, I, I know that, for example, like uh, in LA, um, you know, Richard and, and Roger had actually gone through and looked at a number of spaces and you know, figured out what was the best location. You know, you know, that is a location, location, location. So, you know, I like, I mean, Lower East Side is actually where I was. I was drinking at a bar not too far from here eight, eight years ago when I decided to move to New York. So that's kind of always a good place to kind of return back to. So, anybody else have any other questions? I so and next. <laughs> so assuming, just I'm going on the assumption that the goal is to be a big successful artist, like any day if you want to fill that in, for whatever that means to anyone. Um, most of those artists have attain, uh, attained that superstardom, that type of prestige through the gallery system. Now that artists uh, like yourself are going this route, do you think that same level of success is attainable? 
Absolutely. I mean, you know, you look at Charming Baker, and I mean, he's he's done incredibly well, like exponentially well compared to, in comparison to, to me. But you know, you look at Shepard Ferry and stuff. I mean, Shepard Ferry did well because he sort of maintained contact with his collectors. He didn't have exclusivity contracts with his galleries. You know, he, he sold from his studio. He, he he was he was in the thick of it all. He didn't just sort of give his work over and then get a check. Like he was he was part of the whole deal. And so. You know, he was the conduit through which everything flowed. And I think, like, know, knowing or at least having the ability to know what's going on what was, was pivotal for everything. Then, if I may follow up to the board, why is, uh, and you, a lot of people know my opinion <coughs> galleries, you galleries. Uh, why, why, why a gallery? Why has it, if people are able to do it? gallery, actually. Because, you know, you are right. Like, you I thought, kind I of, it was a mentorship, I, and there yeah. was a, like, you never No, and I do see benefits of it, but, but like I said, the reason that I was really interested in, in this model is because of all of my artist friends and artists that I write about and help out, ask me for help that really a gallery should be doing. Right. And I, I just feel like I'm seeing the system crumble a little bit, or if they're just not working hard enough. Right. Is it that they don't know? Is it that the galleries that are coming up now? Because it seems like, like there are certain things like where art has become a bit of a racket. You know, like, like yeah. oh, we're going to you know, sell this and make a bunch of money. And, you know, and... And I've um, seen galleries come and go in like nine months. Right. Oh, exactly. show up in galleries. It was so fun. And they're like, it's not So that might be, as you're saying, that's part of it as well, it's just not the right people. Or, I don't know. I just feel like, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but right. I feel like a lot of... The, the artists that I know that are working with galleries, the galleries are going to be caught up more and like, oh, we have to be, I mean, it's also part of, there's a whole other discussion where the art world is becoming way more competitive. And they're like, well, we have to be at this art fair, well, we have to be this, and like, we have to like, run all over the world and right. show a presence, but the artists are the ones that are ending up like being, being cheated, like their work may be sold, but they need more than just like a, like a conduit for sales, they need advice, they need help like doing like day-to-day -day things, like, and, and especially writing a press release, like, no artist should ever have to write a, <laughs> a press release. And there are more artists that he can talk about his work, but I have plenty of artists who are like, well, I don't know what's right. what to do. I think <laughs> a lot of them do transparency, too, is that you see a lot of, you know, I think a lot of galleries, because now the accessibility of artists and everything else, like, a lot of artists have kind of closed in ranks if they don't want to know people, how people do business. And for me, like, what it comes down to, like, if you're selling my work, if I trust you, I'm loyal to you. I'm not going anywhere. Like, I don't want to go out and meet a bunch of people I don't know and have to hustle numbers. Like, it's not, it's like, that's not the fun part. I just want to make some shit in my studio and then have you sell it for me. But I think that, that a, lot of, a lot of galleries have gotten to a point where they close in their ranks and so now they don't tell you who the fuck they are. They don't tell you where they're going to even what country is living in. And they won't have you give me any follow up information. Like, I'm not, I, I don't want to leave you. You know, it's so, sort of like, and you, you sort of equate it to like you were in a personal relationship. That would be like me taking the key away so you couldn't leave the apartment so you'd stay with it. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm with you because I like you, because I want you to kind of respect you and value your opinion. So, don't take my apartment, by the way. <laughs> you know, but like, and, and I think that, that when it comes down to trust, I mean, there's only so many people that are trustworthy in this world. And so, like, you just fucking do like, like, but, Yes, yeah, sir, in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, this is for Lori and then for you. I think um, one of the extraordinary things about the way the art model is changing is, you mentioned it briefly earlier, which is about the internet and the accessibility of artists. First of all, Lori, I think blogs like art are, are really changing the face of the art world because you give us access to places that, as a fan, we don't get to go. And Logan, I think what you do on the internet wise and with your fans and all your social media stuff is, is you allow us an insight into an artist that was never available before. So I don't think it's that you destroy the mystery, but I think you make it really personal. So first, Lori, how do you think blogging is changing the art world? And Logan, how much has the internet helped your success? Blogging is changing the art world by letting a bunch of 22-year-olds Big twenty dollars for writing about art. No, but like, there are a lot of there are a lot of blogs out there. But I think it, it does make everything more accessible and more personal. And uh, that I don't know. There's plenty of like Facebook has kind of changed everything because before I was totally against Facebook, and then I realized I'm meeting a lot of clients and artists, and it, it creates relationships that would take years and a lot of money to fly all over the world. So I don't know. How to answer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> True. 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 Yeah, for, for me, like especially because I'm 
But the work that I make, you know, I would like to think, first of all, that the work should stand awesome regardless of whether I'm in the process or whatever else. But if you do like it and you want to go further with it, then being able to kind of explain the technique or the process or the ideas or whatever else, I mean, it helps you kind of talk about the whole backstory that sort of goes along with it. You know, I mean, it is interesting to think, like, well, what if, like, Joseph Boyce was around? You know, like, what would that Instagram feed look like? <laughs> or, you know, like, you know, like, you, you, you think of someone, someone, someone that Warhol would probably do great, like, in Jackson Yeah, like, but if, if some artists just wouldn't cut it, like, like imagine, like, Jackson Pollock, like, fuck that bitch. I'm <laughs> gonna drink more now. Like, so, but, like, you know. But it also adds an entire layer to your job, too, if you have to have an online presence yeah. and be aware of it, or not care of it. Well, also, I think that, like, especially with art, it gets to a point, and sort of depressing to say this, but, like, the, the, the physical, like, raw talent that it goes into making something, at a certain point, becomes just one of the many components that's part of success. I mean, you don't want to buy work from an asshole, so you kind of follow up and make sure there's not a jerk. You want to make sure he's going to be around for a bit, so you can sort of follow and see how committed he is for her, or whatever the need. You know, and I think that the social media kind of helps you sort of perpetuate what it, your identity as an artist, and then shows your human, and shows your process, shows that like twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, that that's what your life is about. You don't feel that takes away from the time that you At a certain point, it just becomes part of your lexicon. You know, I mean, how many times do you check your phone or get your text messages? What is this daily? Like, you know. Doing the talk at you know one fifty four stand, you know I think I think the key for social media is getting it to a point where you just don't kind of think about it. Um, you know, I don't think a lot of people post that. It really is. How much time do you want to like screw around like you know watching TV? It's like I just I eliminate all the TV and replace it with social media. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's like a good trait. Uh, I'm saying I still screw off. It's just stuff is slightly more productive. Do you think that takes away? Kind of some of the essence of what you do. I mean, now social media, social media, you see like everything that everyone does. Right. And yeah, brunch. I just here. I'm doing this now. And before, when you were an artist, kind of what spoke to you about them was looking at the work and kind of guessing or like understanding. I think for me, I don't think it's taken away. I think I think the internet has kind of benefited me because it does have some sort of you know, some backstory like the process and whatever else. But yeah, I mean, like, look how big like minimal art or performance art or installation art is. I mean, you know, if you're like an audio, like, minimalist artist, I mean, do it like a Snapchat of a 14, you know, or an Instagram, like a 14 minute syllable, you know, one sound isn't going to really translate well than that. For me, like, it happened to translate well and I've benefited from it. And, you know, whether or not, like, my work is subconscious and been tailored towards that is kind of impossible to, to, to guess. But I mean, you know, I happen to do well for it. And I think people that, you know, you look at people like Shepard Ferry, and I think that he's someone who very clearly has benefited from the internet age because he has like bold graphic colors that you can get fairly quickly. And you look at it, and you get it, and you go on. And so, like, his work kind of makes an impact. Yeah, I mean, but there's tons of artists that I like that you see a picture, and, you know, you see it in, in real life, and you see those, like, real subtle gradations and ribs or whatever else. And, uh, you know, it's sort of a shame that people don't. That, that they don't benefit as well as I, as me or Shepard or someone else does. I, I don't, and looking at art on the internet, just, this isn't a good question, but I don't see that, I don't consider that to, in the same realm. I consider seeing art and then looking at art on the internet to be two entirely different experiences for me. It's like looking at the Big Mac or the McDonald's commercial and going there and seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> Not so much seeing the art, but the process behind it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, I mean, that. that like I said, some, some people I say think, yeah. I mean, because I know there's some artists that I know is like, I know it takes them like 20 minutes to make something. Yeah. And you see them, you see it on the internet, and you know that they're digging themselves up. I'm like, it'll take you four days to make that. <laughs> you, you did that while you're making breakfast. <laughs> you know, so yeah. It, it, but I mean, again, everything sorts in the advertising age is how you can sell it. You know, if people buy into it, it's a bit of a true. So, like, can I. Yeah. On that thing, so would you say that it's creating like the visual component isn't as as heavily relied upon with what you're doing? Like, I mean, yes, something you read well, and so then you know, Trevor Carey, you can read it. But is it more like the voice and the, the identity that you're building? Like, that's what the, the internet can successfully help you do. And 
A little bit, but I don't think that's changed much from, from anything else. I mean, you go back and I mean, look at like minimalist art. You know, behind the minimalist art, there was some gallery owner going like, "This dude's a shit. We gotta buy it." You know, so like the gallery owner was the early Facebook, and so like you have someone saying like, "He's the guy that you need to buy stuff off of." You know, I mean, no one walked into a gallery and go like, "I really need that black canvas." Yeah. You know, and so I think that the, the validation now simply comes from the artists themselves, as opposed to. The sort of gatekeeper saying like, no, he's the, he's the only one. He's the one you're going to want to buy stuff from. And so I think that that has become more sort of diplomatic in the fact that like you can go through and you can check what I've said the past ten years online, and you can see if I'm consistent. You can see if I'm truthful, and, and see like how, how committed I am to my craft. So you're also you're creating like a value proposition around your 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 what you're doing. Yeah. Your, your, that consistency, that that long, that sort of like. Your, that is, I'm just trying to figure out what the balance between the visual component is and then the voice of the artist. And like, where, where He's basically thing? writing himself his own history in, yeah. in, on the internet. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, for, for me, like, art, art's always existed yeah. on, on the levels of, like, first, first and foremost, it's aesthetic. Yeah. Like, I can tell you whatever you want, but if you don't like this painting, I'm not going to talk you into liking this painting. Yeah. So the first and foremost is aesthetic. The second of all, like, if there's a backstory to it, if there's a reason why I made this and I used that model and those colors and it's in modern, that's a secondary thing. And then the third is the artist himself. Like if the artist is someone interesting and you realize like, you know, whatever, like you know, someone might have a drowned or whatever else, then it kind of it adds an extra layer. So art art always exists on different layers, but the first and foremost is always the aesthetic. Yeah. And I think that all you, you may be able to talk someone into liking a painting occasionally. Fact is, like I know what I like. Like you can sit there and talk for twenty minutes, but it's shit, it's shit. So maybe but I mean the attention of people that decide to the drags and people coming online, like, you know, maybe their first intention isn't to actually see so much the physical characteristics of it, but to actually like people are coming on with a different um, angle when they're looking at art now. I think we're being trained to go on and find these the artists and see their consistency and see what they're doing and how their studio is and what well, I think also like, the appreciation for artists exists on different levels too, where it's like, it used to be like art, the people that bought art were the top echelon of society. Now, like, I get the high school kid emailing me that he actually looks up to the fact that I'm making a living off art, and he wants to do the same thing. And so he may not buy the art, but you don't have to buy the t-shirt. Yeah. And so now you have different levels of appreciation that, like, kind of exist. And you have people that, like, they'll never afford art that are, like, you know, middle class, but they just really appreciate what you do when you do something you speak, so you can hear that. But, you know, that middle class person that's never going to buy a piece of art, if they went to a gallery 20 years ago, they would never get to talk to that artist because you're not going to buy something. I'm not going to introduce And it's not like the artist is sitting in the gallery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so I, just, I think it's, it's opened up the doors of appreciation. You have multi levels of like appreciation instead of simply like this kind of parasitic relationship where it's like, yeah. we have art, you buy it, you can make money off of it. And if you buy it, we'll then introduce you to the artist. Yeah. Now there's much more of a like, yeah. Thank you for Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, this is, uh, this is more like it's a statement of question and, and love it. I'm just a guy that uh, a year ago decided to put a mural in my backyard. And because of the internet and how accessible street artists are, or just artists in general, uh, through the internet and through Facebook, I happen to be able to get that done. Um, I've been in galleries, I can't stand one from galleries. I don't even know the most, I won't buy from galleries, I uh, depend on them. I tried to buy one piece from a gallery from the vine and you know they swore up and down they didn't call me and they never called me. You know, I just I just I never understood it. Maybe I walk in with you know sweatpants and sweatshirt, you know, I've been to opera and George at Opera has treated me like an absolute dog. You know. And and Logan knows that I have probably more art than here on my head. Um, but because of the accessibility of art, you know, through the internet, through Facebook, and blogs, especially blogs, um, I'm able to just buy work from artists locally. Um, I'm able to have them here in my backyard by three unbelievable artists whose personalities far exceed their talent, and their talent is beyond belief. Um, and I've been able to amass a collection of unbelievable European artists that most people don't even know over here, just again, through blogs like uh, the fan blog. Or you said you will later. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, I, I think also it's like I think back to myself, like back in high school, 
I mean, I remember, like, you know, <laughs> like, you would find that, like, that band that, like, you like, yes, that's what I'm thinking. They managed to put into words what I feel. I'm like, <laughs> you see that person with the shirt on, you look at each other and be like, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like, how many times have you, you know, like, you're listening to something like, oh, man, I give anything to go off a drink with, like, you know, Shane from the Pogues or whatever. And I think, you know, nowadays, like, art, uh, art's, art's kind of like the, that sort of, sort of version where you can see someone that kind of, you're like, oh, fuck, you speak my language. And you yeah. can actually have a, have a connection with them. And, you know, money enters into it, but really you want to find someone that kind of feel like you're either aligned with or that you have a unique, you know, perspective with or, or whatever it is. And the uh, you know, internet's opened all that up. Except if you really like an artist's work and then he becomes an asshole and you meet the person with the schools And then you don't yeah. like working with oh. the <laughs> 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 So the handsome man in the back? I, I, I know there's a couple of curators, so possibly two or three. And, um, and I think it's very interesting how curators are also changing the model of kind of how pop up shows happening, how museum shows happening, how work on the street happens is now curated. <laughs> how um, there's some curators that take over extraordinary buildings in other cities, and I'd like to hear, like, do you hear from curators online, and, and do you enjoy working with them outside of the galleries? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, like, anyone that's just focused and passionate in whatever they do, like, yeah, I love her. I mean, like I said, like, I don't want to deal with business. I mean, that, that's not what my forte is. I don't want to deal with curation. I just want to make some work. And so, like, yeah, when you find someone that's passionate and focused on what they do, like, it's a beautiful thing, because... Then it kind of is one less thing that you need to worry about, and you can go back and you know, retreat and be a hermit in your studio. Yeah, right. So, yeah, my heart gave So, it's my goal eventually to find people around me that are so like, pronounced in, in their, their fields that I can become like one of those white albino uh, salamanders that never speaks a lot of day. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So, any other questions? So, I'm an stencils too, and I'm curious as far as the process goes, how do you get from like the photograph to the outline of the stencil before you cut it out? Like what's the transition in that? Um, without bogging down people too much with technical stuff, yeah. I mean really like, you know, take the photos, then, then kind of go in, idealize them, you know, touch up, you know, twist and manipulate as I need them to, to sort of convey the vision that I have. Uh -huh. And then really just break it down the high, medium, low contrast, um, you know, obviously there's 15 different layers of that. And then just, just layering it in and then, uh, then spray it down. So, you know, with ones where like, there, there's clearly different areas, you know, I'm just masking out, say, like the arms or the dress or the face or, or whatever yeah. it is and just spraying that, that area out. Um, but, you know, I start, I start working, you know, work with like the lightest or the, the darkest color to light. So it's counterintuitive the way you do a serograph or, you know, screen print. And, uh, you know, start with like a black background and just kind of work slowly and building stuff up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, in a way, like it used to be, I would think of myself more as, as screen printing, but now I almost see it more as like, photography than, than screen printing. Yeah. You know, each layer that you put on is very similar to the way that you kind of like, if you ever develop photographs, you're sort of shaking it, you see it slowly kind of like, you know, build up and mm -hmm. in the tray. Yeah. Back when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's true, actually. <laughs> You said you also made clear white models that you know. Do you ever hire hire models? Um, I, I work with models that, that I don't know personally. Um, but I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a, a handsome salty dog at the end there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, so, like, I've worked with a friend of mine that said that I wanted, like, a redhead. Um, in nautical, like, in the degree that redheads carry a lot of superstitions and divisions. So, I was like, you know, like, I really want, like, a redhead. So she found, found me one that kind of, you know, did whatever. But I'm not opposed to working with anyone under any circumstance as long as the face that I'm looking for. Yeah. What kind of water do you use to uh, I don't use water at all. Um, Use like a, a universal 24 by 36 inch laser with like a 40 watt laser. Um, I also use like a CNC 404 foot by 8 foot bed. Um, do you find that out or do you have that option? I, I, have, I have a friend, I have a guy that I've worked with for nearly 12 years on and off, and uh, he exclusively does all my stuff. Um, he, he's really the only guy that I trust at this point. I know she's doing etching work too. Same thing, C, CNC with like an etch, etch, uh, etching point. 
But if you use, has anyone uh, used the product to do some more work? Yeah, I know a lot of people that actually, um, there's a few people like, uh, like, uh, you know, like Trusto Corp, for example. I know they, they use like a vinyl plotter for some of the stuff that they do. And, you know, they use the vinyl and spray it and mask it all. Do you know anybody that actually has a home plotter? Because I know that Roman makes some small plotters, like some large plotters. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of them out there. Um, you know, yeah, Roland's well, probably the most common, but I mean, yeah, I've but never used it. Is it software? Is, that, is it something that's um, cool? Yeah, no, no, no. You know, you, know, you send off like that. Yeah, you know, like, I've, I've gone back and forth with. Whether or not I should get my own equipment, but I have a guy that busts his ass for me. Like I, I get emails from from him like four o'clock in the morning. He never says I'm up at four o'clock making your shit. Do you he send him out different high level meetings or does he kind of No, no, I, I send him a file that he just hits the go button on, and he knows how to make his machine sing. Um, I, I, so every single bridge that you see, I draw every single bridge individually. I go through and I etch out everything individually. I go hand draw everything. Individually. You know. Like, any any creative work I do, physical production, hitting the button and making the cut, that's all him. I'm a photographer. I like very much to. I do similar work to this. But I like to go kind of photography too. I don't know if I have the, the patience to do kind of these kind of examples. I'm very much interested in the art of these Yeah, no, it's, it's it's kind of. I mean, I don't know. Like I don't know how to do it. Does it seem like that there are shortcuts? Until you want to start doing them well. <laughs> and, then, and then you realize that they start sucking your time just as much as anything. I mean, if you're doing like one color stencil, stencils are awesome. There's plenty of things out there where, you know, if you're doing the one color stencil, you could probably hit like a, a hit the art button in Photoshop and probably make a stencil out of it. But you can start doing 15 stencils and start working with color theory and composition and stuff like that. It didn't, didn't take on a whole new, you know, whole new uh, range. You have to that oil board. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's what I asked him to cut it so, but I mean, yeah, you can cut it on a monitor, you can cut it on PVC, or actually, you can use CNC for PVC. Um, yeah, but there's a dozen things. You can do it in a cardboard, you can do it on a chipboard, you can do it on whatever you want. For me, oil board is the most effective. Because I'm looking at your work and I'm trying to ask you my head how long it would take to cut some of those stents and stuff like this. Wow. That one probably took three days. That's with the machine. So you were cutting, cutting it three days. What would it be if you were cutting it? The fact that my hand would at least take me two months. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to take me two months. And it wouldn't look half as good as that. Because if there was a while, like, well, I used to cut everything by hand. Like I said, I mean, I spent three and a half weeks. And so, after I've been doing it by, you know, with laser for a bit, I was like, you know, I'm going to the hand cutting. And so I did. I did. And I think it's just. And again, like you said, you can't talk someone into lighting the piece. So, yeah. if you tell them you cut it by hand, it doesn't really make that much better. Yeah. Well, your loyalty is to, to the creative vision that you have, not to the technique that you use to create it you know, like, if I, if I was like a painter, would you go, did you make your own paint? Did you make your own brush? Did you stretch your own canvas? Did you weed them? You know, like, and so like, it, it, it's sort of a moot conversation because like stenciling is such a new medium that the focus is placed on on the production, the technique, not what it creates. Like, there's not a gang of like dudes that are like, I'm an acrylic painter, yo. Like, like <laughs> people have associated like this sort of lifestyle, like what a stencil artist should be. And it's nothing more than a medium. It's how I used to make make what it is that I think. And so, I mean, I think, I think that the longer you sort of put yourself in with this title, like I'm a quote unquote stentorist, the more limited you become. I just make art. I happen to use stencils to make art, but I, you know, if I start using like you know oil paint or acrylic paint or certain sculpture, like my world is the vision that I have. Not how long is your photographer? Yeah, that's your work. I mean, the argument you made, like I'm a painter, I'm a stunt artist, I'm a photographer, you know, like, and I don't know if people try to define all that stuff. I just, I just make a bunch of shit, you know, like, I put shit on the canvas and I hope that, like, it looks happy decent. Well, I mean, how you doing, man? How's it going? I'm not sure about this, this earlier, I don't know who you were like, but can you tell me, can you tell us about the title of the show? I've never said anything. Yeah, um, yeah, I had addressed it a little, a little bit earlier, but yeah, Love Never Saved Anything was based on, on, my, my year last year was first, and it was, you know, a number of setbacks. Um, and, you know, I was, I was in fear of losing a few things in my life, and a friend of mine just told me, yeah, at least you're doing what you love. I said, the love never saved anything. And that was kind of how the, the whole show started off. Um, but, yeah, you know, just based, using personal disappointment to make something that was fairly positive. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> What's the part of the whole process that you enjoyed the most? Like, 
you like more to be pictures or like what you can understand say what's your favorite thing? The that sort of initial seed of like of uh, just of thinking about something. Like the you know, like I started building early on, like, you know, bad ideas make bad art. And so like just being able to kind of sit down in my head going through and sort of itemizing stuff and like think about this and think about this and this and like trying to place like, you know, what would be awesome to photograph in this place with this model and this idea of this myth and, and just putting all this together and just having having like, you know, your head sort of be the conduit of all these sort of arbitrary and abstract ideas um, being the place where it all comes together. You know, and then the rest is sort of just seeing it move the deletion, but like that, that, that part I really enjoy. So, so thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> 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 